Welcome to Shelf Help, a channel dedicated to talking to the void about whatever book I happen to be reading. I am your host, the reader. The following review will contain spoilers. The countries of Bellinger and Amica have been at war for centuries. In all this time, sorcerers have rained down magical death on both sides. Bellinger has been on the back foot for a while, smaller and weaker, and trapped by their geography. They are losing the war of attrition, but they have a plan to turn it all around. Rifles. After generations of trial and error, they have mastered the creation of these weapons that will turn the war. And then Bellinger's magic vanishes. Prince Befault is convinced that Amika is responsible, having invoked the seventh decimate. Without magic or enough rifles to protect his people, he must find a way to take Amika's magic as well, or lose everything. First, I'd like to say what interested me in this book. So often in fantasy, the main character is a singularly unique individual. They're gifted in some way. Usually they're a good fighter, or they care more, or they're just too damn stubborn to give up. But almost always, they are smart in some way. They are witty, or streetwise, or a tactical prodigy. It's very rare for a story to admit that its main character is an idiot, and then follow through. From the text. Furthermore, he knew his limitations. Although he was resolute as he appeared, he was not a clever man. He was not a man who outwitted his foes. His skills were hard-learned, the result of long repetition. They were not the product of quick thinking or inspiration. And that holds true. Befault views the world through a singular myopic lens. Sorcerers bad, Amika bad. Not even Amika sorcerers bad, just all magic users across the board. He views it exclusively through the how magic is used in war. How the gifted can stand out of harm's way and rain death on the ungifted while constantly lauding the advantage rifles give his people. Yeah. There are six known decimates. Fire, lightning, wind, water, earth, and pestilence. The seventh decimate is to take away magic. To find the book that contains this spell is what sets Befault on his quest, along with a handful of companions. Early in the story, Befault has a conversation with a former sorcerer who has lost his magic. Specifically, he was a fire magistrate. The magistrate points out to the prince that he feels loss akin to a severed limb at no longer having magic, and that magic is not just a tool of war. He uses it to light his hearth, to put out a fire that's burning his neighbor's home, to control a burn of fields so crops can be replanted, without danger to the surrounding wilderness. Hell, a fire magistrate is required to forge the rifles Befault is so proud of. Befault is the crown prince. He has no idea how his country functions on the most basic level. None. That is dedication to making your character an idiot. Kudos. That said, there are certain conventions when it comes to writing. And I say conventions instead of rules, because there are times when going against the grain works in a story's favor. This is not one of those times. In my review of Ruin, I mentioned that it was a good thing we did not have chapters about Nathir's inner monologue, because it would have been a lot of heavy navel-gazing. That is all this story is. There is not a single thought in this man's head that we don't have to hear about. And that might not be so bad if it wasn't all angry. Seriously. There isn't a moment in this whole story he isn't frothing at the mouth about something. Achilles would tell this man to bring it down a notch. And again, kudos to dedication of making him a stupid man. He cannot see the world as anything but Bellinger versus Amika. You are with me or against me. You were a good, normal person or an evil magic user. His people would rather die with honor than live with magic. Ignoring the fact that they apparently need magic. 
There is no middle ground, no shades of gray, no neutral parties. It is exhausting, and it's not that big of a book. This is the definition of a single note character. And he's the only character we really see. He has companions, but only talks about them. For example, the first night of the quest, the group is sitting around the fire, and one of them is telling a body story. We don't hear the story, or anyone's reactions. We just have a running commentary with the prince assigning each of them traits. In editing, there's always the advice to trim the fat. That is to say, get rid of anything that does not contribute to the story. Characterization is important, even for side characters. The scene may not contribute to the plot, but it does flesh out the world. These are his brothers in arms, people he's trained and fought beside for years. Some of them die in this story, and they are so bland and indistinct, not only do I not feel anything, I can't remember their names without looking them up. And I really don't care to, because they make zero difference. Also, it would have broken up Befault's endless inner angry monologue. Ah, uh, speaking of one-note monologues, let's move on. Bellinger is a small country. To the north is Hamika, to the west is a sea with an impassable reef, to the east is an uncrossable desert, and there are unclimbable mountains to the south. If you know anything about geography, you probably just went a little cross-eyed. I tend not to get hung up on fantasy geography or weather and patterns. It's a fantasy world that may operate on different rules than we have. And we have all collectively accepted that Westeros only gets winter every seven years. So I can accept this at face value. But I tell you the geography to ask this. How the hell have these two countries been at war for centuries? Amika effectively has Bellinger under siege. Bellinger has to produce 100% of everything its people will need, which is a tall order in the general course of life, much less during war. And assuming they have these sorts of resources, Amika could still dam the rivers and burn the fields. It wouldn't take much to cause a cascade failure of the system. A year, decade at the far outside before conditions forced the government to the negotiation table. And Amika would never have to risk a single soldier. But this seems par for the course. Both countries seem very stupid when it comes to war. In the prologue, the two countries are about to meet on a field of battle what Bellingers call a hell. Now, I don't claim to be a tactical expert, but I have the basics. The game of chess is often used as an allegory to war, and that is because if you go in without a plan, you are going to lose. Every time. And it isn't enough to just have a plan. You have to have a backup, and a backup to the backup and the ability to jump tracks as opportunities present themselves. You want to maneuver your opponent into a situation where you have the advantage, or at least neutralize any advantage they might have. Think of the Spartan 300. They lacked the numbers to take on the Persians, so they chose their location, funneling the larger army through the narrow Thermopylae Pass. That's not what is happening here. The armies of Bellinger and Amiga apparently are meeting at a decided point that gives no one the advantage. A valley where the magistrates can stand on the high ground and rain magic down on the armies clashing below. And apparently every battle is the same. The armies charge each other, the magic starts decimating the enemies, and then the armies engage and it's all sorts and blood. But for this battle, Bellinger has brought its rifles. This should be a game changer. They can pick off Amika magistrates from afar. By giving them to a few select soldiers who are to break through the enemy lines and take up position to start shooting in full view of the enemy 
after the magistrates have stopped using magic. Oh, again, I'm not an expert, but good God, this is dumb. You have a secret weapon that Amika doesn't know about. These soldiers should be getting in position under the cover of darkness, spread out so they can take out magistrates before they can use their magic. Shooting in sequence so it's hard to pinpoint where the sound is coming from. And that's just one of the glaringly obvious changes I would make. This is a great way to suck all the excitement and suspense from a battle. I spend more time wondering how these countries have people left to fight, since they clearly use them for cannon fodder without thought. And at the intersection of Bifalt's endless angry whining and complete lack of military skill are the rifles themselves. More specifically, the metal they are made out of. Bellinger has swords, and arrowheads, and armor, and horse armor. And despite being in war for literal centuries, they have enough metal to be experimenting with making rifles. They rejected early designs like the musket. I'm going to set aside the fact that they apparently went through the entire evolution of the modern gun, because, again, it is stupid, and why would a fantasy world follow the track of the real world? I'm also going to ignore that guns are the least imaginative things to be done with gunpowder, and there are a wealth of weapons that preceded them that would have been a lot more fun and just as useful. The fact that they have metal, steel, apparently are capable of making high-stress steel alloys. So by extension, they have mining, probably in those mountains. So why haven't they cut through to the other side? They can open trade, find allies, and have a secret escape route should the worst happen. Then again, based on how Bethalt treats literally every person he meets, maybe leave whoever's beyond the mountains alone. I'm going to put this on my fourth shelf. There's nothing actively harmful about it, but it's just not a good story. And I'm sad to see a book with such an interesting concept fumble it. Openly dumb characters are hard to come by because everyone wants their character to be clever and witty. If Bavolt had any other emotions besides frothing at the mouth anger and other characters were given space to grow, it would have made the world feel more real. It would have fleshed out the world. It would have been interesting. I also encourage authors to think about the fringe implications of their world. If a world has metal, they're getting it from somewhere. How are they doing that, and what else could they be doing with that technology? Though, if the Earth magistrates that Befault hates so much actually create the metal for his precious guns, that would have been hilarious. Thank you for your time. I know everyone's mileage will vary, so feel free to leave your thoughts.